Thank you everybody for showing up, participating. I'm delighted to have our curator and artists as guests. I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center where I coordinate the lecture series, such as I can. Um, we're delighted today to be talking about this wonderful show with the curator, Kanani Daly, and uh, some of the participants as well. So, um, why don't we start with, oh, Kanani. Uh, tell us about yourself, if you would. You're the guest curator of the show, and I'd love to know what your background is, what your interests are. Um, sure. Well, um, I guess before anything else, I spent a lot of time mothering two children, um, mm -hmm. and everything else kind of works itself out. Um, I, I mean, if I have to mention credentials, I studied art at the University of Hawaii here, um, and I got my BFA, and, um, that kind of has been, I guess, the initiating force that really brought me to the East Hawaii Cultural Center when I worked there um, with, actually it was Andre, who I think invited me to do some volunteer work there and it just kind of grew from there. So I spent um, a couple years working there, I think essentially curating, but um, at the time the title I had was coordinator. Um, okay. And uh, I gained a lot of experience through that, um, and interests. Um, hmm. Well, obviously, I'm interested in art, but more than even more than art, I'm interested in uh, using art as a way to articulate social problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I um, mean, not not just social problems, but just. I guess it's hard to say. <laughs> To identify problems uh, in a short amount of time, but I guess just using art as a visual as well as a stimulus and sensational experience to to understand, I guess, what's going on in the world. Oh boy, there's there's quite a quite a handful there for you. <laughs> Wonderful. And you've been working with, you mentioned Andre. Andre Kramars is our curator at the EHCC. Um, and he, I guess, invited you to do the show or how does that yes. work? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. He was the one who invited me again, <laughs> which um, I'm grateful for, especially in this, I guess, when I was at EHCC, I worked with all the exhibitions, some were pre-scheduled and some I kind of created as I was going. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular exhibition, the Hawaii Contemporary, um, is one that I think, they all have meaning, but this one has more personal meaning for me being that I am Native Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as I mentioned before, this um, making observations of how how art can be used to kind of describe, I guess, um, the social situations that come up. And so I feel like as a Native Hawaiian um, in today's Hawaii, uh, there's a lot of, or because it's contemporary Hawaii, uh, there's a lot of um, comple complexity to, to this kind of exhibition as well as um, my own personal experience. Sure. May I ask, um, where are your family's roots? Sure. Um, I kind of have a long story there, so I'll try to n not go on too many tangents with it. Um, my great-grandfather is Moses Ahuna, who was a holistic Hawaiian healer. Um, he grew Hawaiian plants here and taught the community um, a lot about how to use uh, plans for medicine. Um, he was here actually when there were still horses and walking and there were no, you know, there was no transportation. Um, so he um, saw that transition from, from um, that change. And my other side of, uh, I guess, my background or um, family is actually from Austria. 
Um, mm. So I'm half Austrian. Well, not half exactly, but I'm Austrian, Native Hawaiian, and Chinese. Uh, product of the plantation time here. So Hawaiian, sure. Chinese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's here on the big island. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't born here. I was born in Oahu. Uh -huh. um, so I lived there for most of my childhood life. And then at my adolescence time, I moved here, um, stayed here for a long time and traveled a bit and then decided to come back and make this it my home. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So your roots here are very deep and very strong. Yeah. Well, okay, here's a small tangent. I won't go too far with this, but um, here's part of, I guess, my uh, personal connection to this concept for this exhibit is I was adopted. So I didn't actually grow up with my Hawaiian family on a, a definitely not on a regular daily kind of basis. I, I had uh -huh. visitations. Um, I had stories that were told to me about my family um, when, and, and not, those stories weren't all told to me by, by my family, but it was also by my adopted family. So there was some gray areas there, but um, so being that I was adopted and taken away from my family and native culture because the family that adopted me were from Minnesota and California. Um, I was exposed to two very different ways of, I guess, of, of worldviews, um, especially two different kinds of uh, spiritual concepts and religious ideas. Um, and so, so bringing that to the concept, it's, it's really the concept for this exhibit is called the paradox of belonging. Um, so I think that can be viewed on a broader scale on how Native Hawaiians are experiencing, I guess, alienation as well as belonging to their culture. Um, and then personally for me, kind of being split between these very two very different um, just ways of being. Mm. That's all really interesting because your the concept behind your show is, is I think quite complex and that's an interesting explanation of maybe how it uh, it developed maybe. Yeah. I how think about, let's take a look at some some of the photos from the show. I'm going to share screen and y'all can comment. And where am I? Here we are. Slideshow from beginning. There we are. Kilo Ikamo'o exhibition. And for everybody's information, it's still open. Yes, it is through May, uh, May 27th here in Hilo at the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Um, that's the ad we put together. And here is our guest curator. Oh, that's Daly. an old picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice picture. By the way, I, I was curious. Um, your exhibition had a native Hawaiian uh, consultant, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about her role in the show. Yeah, um, she has a very long Hawaiian name, but we all just call her Kumu Mahina, um, and she is a teacher, I believe, at Kamehameha, as well as at Waldorf, uh, the Malamalama School here mm -hmm. in Puna, and that's actually how I met her. And um, I've, you know, I guess it started with me just kind of coming in to the classrooms and listening to how she um, teaches the children. And mm -hmm. uh, she just, she just has this really great insight, but also this ability to be so approachable. Um, and so I've kind of built a relationship with her and anytime I have questions, um, regarding uh, culture, I go to her. And so I asked her actually to name this exhibition um, because I don't speak Hawaiian except, you know, the simple Hawaiian that maybe everybody here kind of picks up. Um, so I don't know if she's fluent in Hawaiian, but she's, she's uh, very knowledgeable. And so I asked her to name the exhibition and it really was, um, the right decision because 
I wanted the exhibit to be an experience that wasn't isolated to something that's just visual. Um, so that's when I wanted to bring in sound. And she was actually the kumu who did the oli, which is the Hawaiian chant that you hear when you walk mm -hmm. into the exhibit. Um, and, and the meaning of the title, to go back to that, really is to take in your experience through all of your senses. Mm -hmm. huh. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, here's how it looks in general. You walk in, kilo tika mo'o. Uh, yeah, the explanation of the name was, was interesting. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. The meaning of the, the title? Yeah. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, I'll go back a little bit. When I talked to her about my concept and I talked to her about some ideas I had for names, I really wanted story to be part of the title because that is really the way that, you know, that we would learn through oral communication, through stories. Um, and that's still really a big part of learning. And um, it, it is especially with the Hawaiian culture. And um, so we kind of had a conversation about that. And then she returned with the, this title, Kila I Komo'o, which means uh, it, it's used also for um, navigation because you have to the way the Hawaiians navigated um, they had to really use all of their senses um, they had to be very detail oriented they had to pay attention to every detail of the movement in their environment um, and that, of course they had to have knowledge of the stars so it's just this deep awareness um, I love that you know that, um, of course you know Hokulea the voyaging canoe was just I know. Here in Hilo on its way to Tahiti. I made it to Tahiti, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a nice connection. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, I understand that your own idea of the show was to explore the complexities that you've already alluded to, the complexity of growing up with the awareness of traditions, growing up modern, growing up seeing crisis in Hawaii and also seeking somehow to reconcile past and present. Hmm. Is, is that a, a fair summary? <laughs> yeah, um, I think so. Um, crisis, I think, I don't know, I think you can look at it as, I mean, it happened very quickly. Um, and I wasn't born in 1778 when James Cook came to the island and it was really kind of that first encounter that changed so much. Um, for Hawaiians and their, sorry, there's a truck going by. I'm in my car. <laughs> I had some, I'm kind of in between things right now. Um, We're sitting so, here avoiding lawnmowers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the arrival of, of Europeans and the colonization, um, the change of really, I think, the spirituality of the way the Hawaiians uh, lived their lives. It was very intertwined into the way they actually functioned. Um, and then there was the overthrow. Um, when was it in the 1890s? Um, and so it was just a decline of a culture where everything really now is pretty lost. Um, and I know I mentioned in the talk that we had at the opening, that we do want to say that we're, we're rising back up. And I think in some ways we are, but it's, it's not as simple because the way that we used to live, I say we like I was there, I wasn't, I'm born in this time. Um, but you're really looking at the differences between the people who live directly with their environment and resources to now where we live in a very indirect way, basically a capitalist culture. So, so that culture, I feel, our, the Native culture was really shaped as, as that. And so now we're put in this, uh, the impact of colonization. And it's like this, we're not anything, I want to say, particularly special. I mean, this is, this is happening and has happened to all Native cultures. 
Um, and it, it is what it is. So here's here's another part of, of this exhibition is, I don't feel like anger um, is going to solve anything, while at the same time I feel, for me personally, there's always this feeling of resolve, you know. Um, you know, once you kind of start to understand the history and how things have changed and what we're kind of stuck with, um, <laughs> it, mm -hmm. you know. But, it, you know, it's good to look at things in a, in a multifaceted way. Um, you know, there's, there's some positive things happening simultaneously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. So the artists that you got involved with this project, are they all people that you knew already? Or did you, how do you assemble no, a team I'm, of artists? Well, let's see. I did not know Ian. I did not know Nainoa Kala'i. I knew through, we went to college together here. She's actually finishing, I don't know if she's finished, but she's very close, I believe, to finishing her master's, I think in Iowa. Um, she's traveling now and couldn't make it, unfortunately, to this talk. Um, so that's how I met her. And um, Kumu Mahina, as I mentioned, I knew through um, educational situations. And, um, Esri, who did the sound design, is my son. Oh. And here's here's something that nobody knew. Um, I never told anyone. Oh. Laura Dunn is actually my biological sister, who uh -huh. I didn't connect with until my adult life. And I knew that she was um, actually just graduated uh, with her PhD in theology. And so sometimes I try to keep up with her and her journalistic writings, and it's always been interesting to me, um, and I knew that she also did um, photography, so um, I invited her to be a part of this exhibit, being that she's Native Hawaiian and kind of comes from the same split experience that I do. Interesting, and I see that both Laura and Nainoa are joining us today, thanks so much. Oh, we'll look at the, the work and we can hear about it from them as well. Great. And actually, let me start with, uh, with Laura's work here since she's here. And this, I have to apologize. This is my phone photo. Don't blame Andre for the photo. <laughs> it's sort of odd taking a photograph of a photo, but um, Laura, if you're there, I'd, I'd love to hear what you might have to say about this image. Hi, Larry. Hi, Kanani. Thanks for inviting hey. me to the show and to the talk. It's great to, to be here. So happy um, that you are. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this image, um, I feel like I should preface and say that I'm, I'm sort of a, a hobbyist when it comes to photography. Most of my, my work and my life is spent looking outward um, as an observer of culture and people and things. And so ironically, when I take photographs, photographs are an opportunity for me to look inward, even though a lens is pointing outward. So there's a little bit of a, a <laughs> kind of a paradox of practice, if you will, in the way I use photography as a, a journal of the self. So this image in particular, Rebirth, I want to say I took it in either 2017 or 2018. I don't, I don't recall the exact date. And I was living in Berkeley at the time. And had gotten into the, the practice of serious, more serious photography as a way to, to document my ethnographic research. So um, whenever, wherever I would go, I would bring my camera with me. And when I would come back home from the Bay Area, I living in the Bay Area and coming back to Hawaii, um, Hawaii just feels different for someone who, especially Kanaka, who's living in the mainland to come back. Hawaii feels different on those trips back than it does when you're here all the time. And this image was un completely unplanned. I was with my partner and we were walking around the, the east side of Oahu near um, Keihei Lagoon, where my mother, Kanani's mother as well, was her ashes were scattered into the lagoon some years ago after her passing. I don't remember how many years ago. Kanani, maybe you could 
think about it. It was a while. I, I think it was yeah, probably I think it's been more. about a decade. Or yeah, about 10 years ago, I'm thinking. And we didn't plan to stop there, but we thought it might be an interesting place to just kind of walk around and take pictures. And we, and I initially thought there's nothing here. And so I just walked around and just shot photos. And we came across this restoration of the Ahakua'a. And I pulled out my tripod, kind of literally right in the middle of the street. There's a road right there. And there's a, um, a fence. It, and you see these kinds of things um, in Oahu all the time, where you have areas that are fenced off and there's a road built um, to, to kind of mark off where the road was built in the middle of a bunch of other stuff. And this is one such area. So it's a little precarious pulled out my tripod and my camera and I just set it up and I just started snapping pictures. And when I got home and I started to process some of the images there, I don't know what it was. There was a certain um, something that was coming through in the images and it was more than just the content, uh, more than just the, the restoration and this interesting paradox in the image I see of uh, machinery. And I don't know what those are. Um, bulldozers taking Thanks. down some, some of the mangroves. Yeah, ma with the paradox of the, the man-made with, with nature basically. But beyond the content, something was coming through and I, sh I showed the image to, to somebody and she said, <laughs> the photos, there's a lot of mana that comes through the photos. And so, you know, whenever I would think of my mother, um, she was a lot of things and she definitely had a certain kind of mana that uh, was apparent upon meeting her. And so these images were just a way to, became a way for me to do a little autobiography, if you will. You know, my experience, not necessarily of being Native Hawaiian, but of, of being rooted in this place and also being a little bit uprooted from this place. Um, and the image looks like, like it's, it's, tearing something down, but it's really building something up. And so it's looking at that paradox of creation and dest destruction. Um, I think of, of all the images in the show, I think this one surprised me the most because of course, like my first glance was, oh dear, it's a sign of, you know, destroying the, yeah, not Mona, <laughs> destroying the Aina. And then Kanani explained it, oh, rebirth is quite not what I expected. Yeah, yeah. So and the, I, they're, they're restoring the aquifer is what I understand. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's the restoration of the ahapua'a. Um, and I, you know, now that I'm talking about it, I look back in this image and I, I, I think for a lot of Native Hawaiian people who are of, of mixed race, who are betwixt and between, go back and forth, I think the image is a visual representation of experience of what that feels like you know it can feel destructive um, but there is this if we approach it in this way I think that the time and place that we're at there is a really unique opportunity for rebirth right um, we're not Native Hawaiians from long ago we're Native Hawaiians right now and it's um I think it would be a disservice to try to construct a Hawaiian identity based on manufactured images of the past, right? Mm -hmm. What does being Hawaiian look like? Is it a skin color? Is it a way of speaking? Is it a way of dressing? Um, we have this opportunity now to, to create something new. Mm -hmm. And the image I think speaks to that very much. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, I don't have a good image of your other photograph. I'm, I'm using one of the installation images, but it shows a, a ladder going down into the water. Could you kind of tell us about it? Yeah. <laughs> With apologies just... for, the, for the image. No, I, I love seeing it. I haven't had an opportunity to go down and look at the show yet. So looking at oh, it, okay. uh, as it's exhibited is actually really nice. Um, did a great job. It looks wonderful, much better than it does on my computer screen. So thank you. Um, uh, the image is titled Abyss, and this is taken at the Aloha Tower waterfront. 
Uh, and again, this image was unplanned and this was taken, I, I wanna say post pandemic, but are we really post pandemic? Anyway, that's a digression. Um, this was taken kind of right at the end of safe travels and people were coming back to the island and uh, just background, Aloha Tower is no longer a, a tourist destination. It's no longer a place where a lot of restaurants are. It's been purchased by Hawaii Pacific University. So the whole thing has um, been reconstructed and it's classrooms and dorms and just a couple of restaurants are still there. So it was really kind of weird. I used to, I used to live in downtown Honolulu and this is the first time that I had gone to Aloha Tower in quite some time. It was, it was very eerie. It was very strange. It was very desolate. Um, is the there was nobody still there. there? The the what? The brew pub? <laughs> no, oh. it's not. Yeah, oh. um, it's a cafeteria. It's a cafeteria. Believe it or not, it is a okay. cafeteria, and it's. I think it's a dry cafeteria, which I think is kind of funny because it was a <laughs> a brewery before. Um, the only restaurant that's still there, I think, is the old Spaghetti Factory. That's still around, but um, so all of the um kind of memories of Aloha Tower seem to kind of be stripped away with this new space but so I was walking along and uh, having some memories and I just plopped my tripod and camera down and I took the image I took several images in this spot and I had been in Hawaii for the entire duration of the pandemic and so in, in a sense this image shows the opposite end of the previous image, which is rebirth, um, and represents the alternate view. So one view is having a deep contemplation of what it means to be Kanaka. And this image, I think after two and a half years of being in Hawaii and experiencing Hawaii's unique challenges during the pandemic, um, and I, I mean, I don't know how unique they are. There's, I think, some things quite unique to Hawaii as we, we s struggled and continue to struggle through this incredibly difficult period of time. Um, the, the feeling of wanting to, and I hope no, no one takes this the wrong way, but um, wanting to escape, um, I think, for myself, in my own personal history as a Native Hawaiian, there were times growing up where being Native Hawaiian in Hawaii felt like a trap. Um, there were, you know, limited opportunities, um, you know, um, limited access to certain kinds of experiences, educational experiences, cultural experiences, um, uh, you know, economic opportunities, so on and so forth. And so, on the tail end of years of a lot of COVID lockdowns and whatnot, there was this strong feeling um, in with this image of just wanting to get away um, oh. and uh, wanting to be somewhere else. So um, ho hopefully that doesn't strike uh, a wrong note with people, but that is definitely um, what this image is about. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. I wonder, uh, Kanani, what, what struck you about these two photos that, that you wanted to include them? Um, well, this, uh, Rebirth, it really was, I, can't, I mean, I, I knew of the area, um, but it's been a long time since I've been back home. Um, and so just having something look familiar but unfamiliar at the same time was what kind of drew me. To this and then as I started to read more about it and um, also learned that it was the restoration for the Akwa'a, um, it just really fit perfectly with the concept of the exhibit. Um, so I think it was, yeah, just this, there's just some uncertainty when you look at this, um, but you've, you've got to, you know, learn more about it to understand what's happening. Um, and as Laura mentioned, just that, um, looking at destruction and creation simultaneous, simultaneously is what was interesting, especially for me, for this image. And then for the other one, see my memory, I didn't even know 
Laura, I don't know when that whole change happened, but my memory was just like shipments coming in, tourists everywhere, um, down at the Aloha Tower with with all of the restaurants and um, um, to look at it from this perspective, knowing at least what it used to be when I was there, um, kind of gave me this like almost the opposite of what you said. But in this, I guess almost there's some similarities where um, there's it's like just having that blank ocean in front of you um, kind of brought up ideas of, I guess, escape or opportunity, but also the subjugation of that area where that's where everything had come in. And um, that's, you know, that's changed a lot of how we live. Or, I mean, that's changed a lot of how uh, the culture, the capitalist culture basically is operated here now um, on Oahu and, I mean, everywhere on the islands. So to me, it kind of had uh, two sides to that. Um, but I didn't know when did when did it get bought from? Did you say what university? Hawaii Pacific University. Yeah, Hawaii Pacific. I don't know the actual year they purchased it, but it's been a while, you know. And and since I I had been away from Honolulu for so long, I wasn't really keeping up with the development in that area. And it's actually not even really development. I would. What is the opposite of development? I don't know, but um, the. One thing about the image, and I, I think maybe uh, will help people kind of understand kind of this, this sort of like ambivalence present, um, at least within myself, perhaps in the image as well, is that right before then is the, the docking area for the cruise ships that take tourists out. So Star of Honolulu and um, I think Atlantis is right across the way. And so these had all been stopped during the pandemic. And uh, I gone here with my partner maybe um, over the course of like three or four weeks to take images. He was very interested in um, the docking and shipping and this, uh, uh, everything that Kanani you're talking about, uh, you know, our, our kind of like lifeblood here on the islands. Mm -hmm. um, and right as we had returned or were visiting this area once a week for about a month, once a weekend, on, on, over the weekend, over the course of a month, they had just started the cruise ships again, and uh, the, the large cruise ships, and also these that do the tours around the island. And it was, first of all, really interesting to see um, how few tourists there were. Um, and there was a great sadness to kind of witness this dependency on tourism that we have, this dependence on things always coming to us, right? Come here, come to us. Um, uh, and what happens when that is lost? And the, the need for some new way of imagining self and sustenance in Hawaii, you know? So rather there's than a lot present. of ambivalence packed into this picture. Yeah, like, uh, you know, you know, since the 1950s, we've always been, you know, uh, the tourist destination, literally, of the whole world. And to see the um, this sort of strange malaise that came about when tourism stopped. And I, I think all Native Hawaiians have conflicted relationships with tourism, but then to see the effect and wanting tourism to stop or um, needing to rethink our relationship with tourism once it did stop, um, noticing what happened. And this strange, uh, for me, surprising void that was left. Huh, oh, goodness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Mm -hmm. How about uh, and I know if you're around, let's skip over to your stuff. And um, I have three pictures up here by Nainoa. Our grandfather's storm, our mothers were homeless, and omens of war. Um, Nainoa, uh, what, what should we talk about? What would you like to talk about? We've heard you lecture in the gallery. It was fascinating. <laughs> I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, 
Yeah, that, that one was sort of um, pounced upon me. So I'm a little bit more prepared now, I think. <laughs> Which would you like to talk about? Um, we could start with the the first the, ver- the first two, I think. Okay. Yeah, so aloha. My name is Nainoa Rosso. Um, I was born and raised on this island for and lived here for pretty much most of my life. Um, and could I mom, add that you're you're from a a fairly prominent ancient and local family? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my mom's side they come from the Kalapana Kapa'ahu, Mokuhulu, um, Kaimu area, and Kumu Mahina is actually one, one of my ohana. Um, you know the the it's the Puna has been very much like a a fortress of sorts when it comes to the to the the changing times in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And one a legacy of that is our Ohana systems are very much still alive, where, you know, I have all these distant cousins, all these distant uncles who I treat with and who treat me with the sort of aloha that most people only experience with their close Ohana. So I have all these far off, like, fifth, sixth, seventh cousins, whatever, whatever, I don't know the whole um, logistics of how that works, but. To me, it's almost as if they were my first cousins, or if they even were my siblings. There's that there's that sort of closeness that is still present in Puno. And as you mentioned, it's a pretty big family, and there it, it's a it's a very much a part of my work, I guess. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's my intro. Family cemeteries all along the coast there. Yeah. And yeah, the. I mentioned it when I was there at the um, the exhibit that a lot of my work is sort of it sort of revolves around death and how that has shaped the Hawaiian community, the community of my home and my family itself. And you know that's something that's been very on my mind these past few years in the pandemic because this is my first sort of like showing actually since I've been working as an artist since probably 2019, 2018, right before the pandemic. So I got to really, you know, much to the chagrin of my family and friends, kind of just isolate myself for three years and sit around and make work and not do anything else, basically. So this is sort of the culmination of that isolation. And you're you're somewhat self-taught, if I remember. I am. I would, I would consider myself uh, maybe non-traditionally taught because mm-hmm. I, I feel as if, you know, there is that whole academic process and the process of like tutoring. But, um, you know, I very much have, I consider a, there is a genealogy to how I've learned and how I make work. And, you know, it's, it's I like, I'd, I'd hate to take credit for that. <laughs> But yeah, um, the first piece is Our Grandfather's Storm. And for me, it was very important very early on in the pandemic to, for this idea of having impactful names. And that was what, something, what came out of that was having a Hawaiian name and having an English name for all of my work. And, you know, this, the title for this exhibit and, that's, and the... Um, pretty much the whole perspective that this these works are coming from collectively, not just mine. It was very surprising to me because it aligned a lot actually with what I think about and what I've sort of sat with when making these pieces. All these ideas of um, the, our challenges are these two extremities that exist where with the far past and the, the present and the far future. And you know, these hypocrisies and these, um, what is another word for it? Like. Contradictions. Contradictions, that's the word. And the paradoxes of being alive in this time. And uh, our grandfather's storm, I've also sort of named it, is the seminal work, I think. 
that led to the the creation of these pieces and many more that sort of aligned together as their own kind of ahus. I think of them as these ahu kind of spaces where there's this sense of alignment and sense of materiality that kind of sew together and then are sewn into certain places and thoughts and emotions and people and feelings. And that piece, Our Grandfather's Storm, is dedicated to the space of Kalapana. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a very long, it was a very long labored process. Um, the past few years I've been working on it actually. It started off as a recreation of the map of Wahaula by uh, Henry Kekohuma. And um, Wahaula was the first Luakini built in Hawaii by Pa'au. And it no longer exists because it was covered in the late 1900s by the eruption that covered most uh -huh. Kalapana that inundated Kaimu and Kapa'au, who was also covered. So there's- Such a loss. <laughs> yeah. And that idea of human sacrifice and the, the, the sort of self-destruction and the destruction of bodies was something that really uh, sat, that I sat with for a long time. And this idea of like communing with things through pretty violent and terrible ways to sort of like almost beg and ask for, for progress and like for for in times of famine or in times of war, these spaces would be um, put to use, I guess, to really beg and seize favor from whatever they were begging and seizing favor from. And that kind of extremity of the human experience in Hawaii kind of like sung to me. And also this, this is just a, it's a cultural Oof, oh my gosh, you, this is a lot harder than I thought. <laughs> Talking about this kind of stuff, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, um, so it's a map of Wahula, and it's also a, self, a portrait of my grandfather. And over it, I've collaged, over his face, I've put a, a, a piece of my own face. So it's a self-portrait imposed mm -hmm. over a portrait of my grandfather, imposed over a, a map of Wahula. I and, and oh, I understand you you use interesting materials um, with with long historical traditions. Yeah, I, a lot of what I've sought out to do with my work is to sort of completely. It's it's sort of this this extremity of like. I don't know, art, art just seems so foreign to me. And when I think and really sit with the Hawaiian experience, this idea of fine arts really just seems so foreign to that. So to really connect it to my Hawaiian identity, I really tried to make an effort in um, really thinking about place, really using historical practices in aligning structures, things, and functional objects with certain energies and people and timelines. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that for me seemed like making my own art or making make my own pigments, making my own paints, um, attempting to make my own paper, which hasn't really went well. So that's why I've been really outsourcing towards people who have this long genealogy of paper making or that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, oh, yeah, was named after a chant that was is sort of a prophetic chant, and it talks about how. Well, um, it's sort of commonly known as you know, oh, yeah, e kama e ko na moku e ko na moku e kama e oh, oh, yeah, and it talks about how Hawaiians have to bind themselves really to the land that they come from because we're going, there's this almost terrible future set out for us and set before us. And it's almost inevitable. 
and in spite of that, you really have to bind yourself to where you come from and never let go. And this is my process. This was sort of the seminal work that I created to bind myself to Kalapano or to show, to show that relationship of how I bound myself to Kalapano. And it's through my grandfather. It's through the place that I come from. And it's mm-hmm. through all these different images that I've sort of compiled together to tell that story. And that story, you know, I've talked about how I don't really want to share everything. Sure. You know, like it's, it's all, it almost feels like too uh, personal to me to really like spill the beans almost. Fair enough. But, um, it's, there's this old Noyal that kind of talks about how not, you're not supposed to leave your ancestors' bones out in the sun to bleach. Mm-hmm. And it talks about how, you, you know, you only call upon them and you only really invoke their names when you need to. Mm-hmm. And so these, these pieces of works, I hope, kind of function as maps and um, coded languages for my family. So I can really talk to it about them and share my, my own history, my own, like what I've figured out to them through these works. But also they just work, they just function as like beautiful images to anyone who like, you know, walks up and sees them and says, oh, that's nice. I, go, I wonder what, what's that about? What would you be willing to share with us about the, uh, the other one on the page here, Our Mothers Were Homeless? Um, so that one too personal? <laughs> no, no, it's a good. Uh, it, I kind of just mentioned that because I mentioned it in my um, the artist statement that I wrote where you know it's it's a very it's another thing where it's very complicated to it's a very complicated experience to really get out into words the 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 cherishing of family and the cherishing of belonging and wanting to preserve that the either the language to know how to preserve these things and to protect them really doesn't exist anymore. We have to find that out on our own as Hawaiians, I think. And that's kind of a, a terrible thing, I think. That there's that there there's this almost there's this risk of losing everything. Yeah. And um I kind of approach that with this like fatalistic sense of you know, they're, it's going to die. Like, we, we, maybe, maybe the Hawaiian people are already dead and we don't even know it. And I mentioned um, that word ma'ele. It's my grandmother's um, family name. And that word is used to describe things that, um, things that really, like, evoke terrible fear or something that, like, shakes you to the core. Either... In, in fear or in adoration mm-hmm. and I think that kind of binds my my perspective together that idea of you know my love for my family my love for my land my love for my culture is so great that it shakes me in both great fear and in great love mm. it almost uh, sounds to be like the old 19th century art concept of the sublime which is both I, terrible I, and uplifting I, I've actually, yeah, so in the course of the pandemic, I really clung to that idea of the sublime and the romanticists and those just look really like looking through this like library of images of these great and terrible landscapes of these huge towering mountains, these like, like, just this idea of being stricken with awe. Mm-hmm. Is something that, you know, it really connects to the Hawaiian experience. I think this romanticized idea, maybe not so much romanticized, but this idea of, you know, when I look out to the ocean, there's this almost like trembling feeling that you can, you can really reach out to. You don't see it all the time. You don't feel it all the time, but there it's, it's there when it, appear, when it reveals itself. Mm-hmm. When you look, when you see, when, 
you know, for the past few generations, these volcanic eruptions that have inundated our family lands, there's this terrible fear of losing all these places where our families are buried, where we've like these places that have raised us, but also there's this great sense of life affirming where mm -hmm. you see that volcano erupt and it's, it's like unspeakable how affirmed you feel as a Hawaiian from Puna, just seeing your land um, reveal itself in such a way. Mm -hmm. huh. So that, that second piece, um, I don't recall the Hawaiian name off the top of my head because I took it from a oral history that Kepa Mali did with Uncle John Hale of the Hale Ohana. Huh. Um, and um, Uncle George Keloha and um, my great grandfather's brother. And this piece is sort of bound to the space of Pohoiki and Keahialaka, where um, it has really been a pico of our family, that place of Lower Puna, and it no longer exists in the same shape as it used to. And a legacy of that shape was that, well, when my mother was a teenager, she was homeless on that beach with my grandfather and my, bro my uncle. So this was sort of me sort of codifying that relationship of this place that raised me, the place where I pretty much learned, you know, my dad used to take me surfing there all the time. It's really a family it was the one place we really had besides Kapoho that where we could go down as families and swim together. It was just such a storied place that held so many connections and so much just innate power and it no longer exists in the same shape as it used to. So this is sort of my like, my love poem to that space and recognizing the terrible history that is there but also just, you know, in honor of my mom, in honor of that space, in honor of my uncles. Hmm. That's fascinating, thank you. Huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of these, it, it's neat. Um, Kanani, it's wonderful how all of your artists have such a different take on that bundle of themes that you were wanting to emphasize. The, the grip of, of, of tradition, the fact of modernity, the shifting sands or <laughs> lava, if you will, it, they're, they're all so different. Um, we just have a few minutes left here and I'm wondering, maybe, uh, can I, maybe you would like to choose one of these images to chat about? Hmm. No, I wish Ian could be here, this really is his work, um, but I can tell you, I guess, what it was about his work that um, drew me to him. And I felt like he just had a strong political perspective, um, but it wasn't one that was void of this deep na'au or knowing um, of the strength of being Hawaiian. Um, it, it didn't feel, I think when I looked at his work, it didn't feel, it, something about it felt resolved, I guess. Um, and this piece here that you have, um, he actually, this, Andre and I, he's not here, the artist isn't here. Um, and so he sent me a graphic image of something that he wanted to do. Um, and we originally thought to do it at Kalakaua Park across the street but oh. um yeah the logistics of that wasn't easily orchestrated so <laughs> um, i just said well let's do it in the gallery um so it was downsized and then just given to me as a graphic um and he chose to use red mulch um, as the material and um i actually learned more about the piece at the opening uh, because he didn't really share too much about it with me. Um, I think it was probably due to time. Um, but it means to rise up. And I know I actually had a really good description of what the name of this piece, which is Kukula 
kumuhana um, means. And um, it's just kind of, it was interesting actually how it, it really did align with the concept in, in the way that I wanted to have this conversation of um, through the pieces of um, the rising up of the Hawaiian culture um, from, I guess, the decline, um, but also addressing the reality of it will never be the same. Um, and not that I necessarily, I guess, romanticize about it being the same uh, as far as the history, um, I feel like, like Laura had mentioned, that this is a time for us, an opportunity for us to take that um, that history and create something new, but still aligned. Um, and so this piece um, does, it means to rise up. And um, at the opening, actually, that day, uh, when Kumu Mahina walked in, it just so happened that, um, you know, all of the mess on Mauna Kea, um, there was some resolution there and some of the kupunas who were put in prison for standing up for Mauna Kea were released. And so um, there was some, some rising up and some movement that happened um, on that day as we were speaking about this piece. So to me, that's kind of a spontaneous miracle. <laughs> Um, but I, I can't, that's about all I can say. Um, if either of these artists want to, I guess, expand on the title, um, feel free to talk more about it um, from your perspective. Um, that's the nice thing about art is when you get to talk to the artists, you understand where their meaning comes from, but then there's this collaborative uh, experience that can happen when we see how everyone experiences it. Mm. And I'm horrified at my typo. Ian's name does not have a J in it. I really apologize. Oh, so I didn't even notice. Too fast. <laughs> um, how about, let's take a look at, whoops, our fourth and final artist. What can you tell us about her work? Hawaii. Um, yeah, so I feel like when I saw her work, it really embodied what you cannot see, the spirit of this place. Um, I mean, just as Naino mentioned, just to be in, in a place that has family history, um, I mean, just to simply be uh, on the uneven walk to the ocean from the lava to, to you know, be in a place, you have this feeling, but you can't always you can't talk about it because it's just such a big feeling. Um, and when I saw her work, I felt like it really did describe that feeling without it actually being any particular place at the same time. Um, and so this piece, the, or this series of work, um, just kind of reminded me of the power of the environment that we live in um, and to tread respectfully with reverence um, because there's just so many unseen things that that make up this place. Mm -hmm. hmm. And could you tell us what the materials are she's using? I think this one was a lithography piece. Um, I have to, I should, I'm sorry, I should, I should have reread some of the descriptions, um, but it's a printmaking process. Okay. Um, and it's, and it's on really cloth, just, I think. Um, I believe that this is not on cloth. This is on paper. Um, ah. It looks like it's handmade paper. Um, and there, she does have cloth pieces um, in the exhibit, but these aren't, these are on um they look like mulberry, probably. I don't know if it was a Hawaiian mulberry. It, I mean, it's not. I mean, you can make kapa out of, obviously, the, the, um, the, I'm blanking on the name. I know the, the, top the, 
Top well, top. there's a name for the plant. I, I believe they are. Um, it's some sort of mulberry paper. Mm -hmm. I, I, but there's different I, ways. You 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 can you can make the paper out of the tr traditional way where you like for hours, days, months beat this paper, um, or you beat the fibers of the bark till it expands into a cloth, um, or or you can beat it until it becomes as thin as paper. Um, but right. this particular one, it might have been mulberry, but it wasn't done in the traditional way. Yeah, I, I stuck my face up to it. It it looked pretty, it looked pretty washy like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to reluctantly uh, bring this to a close at this point. And, oh, I wonder, Kanani, Kanani if you have any thoughts about um, how the show came up, met your vision, how it may have pushed you somewhere else. What's your, what's your experience? Yeah. With the show? Um, well, it really did start off with this idea of a paradox, but it grew into the paradox of belonging. Um, and it also grew into a personal um, experience, which I feel like sometimes I participate in things or I create things for a long period of time. And it's only really at the end of it that I kind of understand more about why. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, and um, the personal, I guess, experience which I explained a little bit at the beginning um, really did come through for me where there's this feeling of because I was like literally split between two families I guess as well as I mean it's I'm not I'm not saying everybody every native Hawaiian probably feels this way even if they weren't split uh, but this not being Hawaiian enough because the privileges to say even learning how to speak my own language will cost me, you know, university fees, mm. you know? So there's like, um, yeah, this, this divide of not feeling Hawaiian enough on some occasions. And then this feeling of not feeling, I guess, Haole enough. It's just kind of a weird way to exist. Um, but at some point I've, I've, you know, I've just let go of that. And this is when, it becomes interesting because as the artworks and as Laura mentioned, this is the opportunity to create something entirely new, but we have to use intelligence and we have to remember our past um, so that we don't, I guess, uh, I mean, we're always vulnerable, but um, so just, just to carry with that wisdom with us as we make our decisions, as we move forward. Mm. And so, yeah, the, the whole exhibit, um, I guess the design of the show, um, I felt was kind of had this mild feeling, but also this strong uh, feeling. Um, I think a lot of that actually had to do, which you had asked me in the beginning to talk about this, the sound, um, mm -hmm. which I'll just say a little bit about that. And then I know it's about four minutes past 11, so I won't take too much more time, but um, we had Kumu Mahina um, share that chant with us. And it was short, it was only maybe like one or two lines um, that repeated itself. Um, and when we were in the recording studio, I had my son there with me. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, giving various, uh, different variations of how to do this chant. And sometimes it was really fast. Sometimes I had a strong punch. Sometimes it was a little bit slower. And she'd done it several times and I just thought, okay, I don't want to overwork this. Um, I'll just take it home and see what I can come up with but then my son stepped in and he said no 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 we have to keep going because something's still not right and he'd asked her to to leave out the punch in part of the the chat where where the voice gets really strong I mean it's still there but it's so much more subtle um and so his direction actually really I think helped create some of that power that you feel when you walk in because he also combined it with uh some of his, he's, I mean, he's 16 years old and he's kind of really into music. And so he, he, he used this contemporary way to, uh, to showcase her chant, which oh. again, I just really felt like, okay, this is just exactly what I'm, I'm trying to go for, for this exhibition. 
That's fascinating. So when you attend the exhibition, you're surrounded by this, this wonderful soundtrack as you look at these fascinating, beautiful works of art. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Uh, thank you, Kanani. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Nainoa and our audience. Anybody have any questions for, for our speakers? Any question? No. Do I hear anything? Mm, no, I don't have a question, but I just really want to take a chance and say thank you, Kanani, and every artist participating in this exhibition, which is very thoughtful, very calm, and because it's calm, it's actually more thoughtful. You have a space for for thoughts <laughs> and enjoy the exhibition. So I really am really happy and thankful for, for having this chance of, of having all these artists and the exhibition. So Kanani, again, thank you very much for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Coming from you, it really means a lot. Thank you. That was Andre Kramars, our curator uh, in residence here at the EHCC. And thank you, Andre, for all you did to put this together as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think I'm going to call that a wrap. And thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day.